my opening slide, I said, I showed a picture of Warren Buffett with the title, A 40% Stock Market Collapse. That is actually the title of a slide that I'm taking the presentation from. Warren Buffett is considered the most um, watched and analyzed investor and the best investor in the world over decades. And he is signaling uh, high risk, is accumulating cash, has accumulated 189 billion in cash, waiting for the next opportunity. There's a story in this, and I will explain. Hi, I'm Ben Repond. Welcome to my YouTube broadcast. Today is July 9th, 2024. I want to begin with uh, some slides, some, some economic analysis, and, the, and I'll begin here, and this is with job openings. What I'm, what I'm gonna, the theme of what I'm gonna say today is about uh, there is risk that is increasing and increasing and increasing in the market today, both in the economy and the stock market. There are parts of the economy and parts of the stock market that don't show that. That does not mean there's not risk there, and I will uncover that for you. So this one is the beginning of private job openings as opposed to government. So when you look at total job openings, including all forms of government, it does not look like this. Government jobs are increasing and increasing. Government does not create anything, it just spends your money. Private industry, private enterprise creates things and creates jobs. So there are two ways to look at it, government, private, and both. This one is private. You can see that the amount of job openings is declining and declining over the last few years. It's not showing up in the stock market numbers and it's not showing up in the total employment numbers for the reasons I just stated. This is a 60 year chart going back to 1960, 60-ish years, going back to 1960. So this is a long period of time. This is a, definitely a macro chart squeezed into this amount of time. So you can see the, um, the employees, the people who are employed full time uh, over that period of time. And most of that time, it goes up and down and up and down. And then you have these extreme swings. You can see the first swing down, 2008. You can see the second swing down, 2020, which was the pandemic when basically everything shut down. And then it skyrocketed after that in reaction to the down numbers. And from there, I put a red arrow, from there you can see how far full employment has dropped just in the last two or three years. So uh, jobs, full-time jobs, particularly those that w require, you know, people to be highly qualified, are, draw, are going away. And that is my point. And this came from the Federal Reserve. This, each of these lines, this is credit card defaults. So I'm gonna go from jobs over to credit cards. Credit card defaults, people are defaulting on their credit card debt. Each of these lines represents a different demographic. The red line, which is most prominent above, is the 18 to 29 year old group, which is the youngest group. And the others, you know, are closer to each other. All of them, when you look at the very end of it, all of them have begun to accelerate up, delinquencies accelerating up. The one accelerating up the most is the 18 to 29 year old group. I don't have to explain this, it is self-explanatory. You go over to office vacancies, office vacancies are approaching 
this is the highest it has ever been in history. So, you know, a lot of times it's, you know, 10% or 15%, but when you get all the way to 20%, what is it telling you? It says that this is not a period of growth. This is a period of work from home. And, you know, maybe there's a positive message in here. Uh, but it's also so that businesses are pulling away and pulling back, avoiding the office expense because they're looking for a less costly way to do business. And people are, in many cases, very efficient in working from home. There is a delinquency rate in multifamily housing, at least where it is recorded. And you can see at the very end of the chart for the last couple of years, delinquency rate has gone up and up and up. People unable to afford their rent payments. This is uh, real estate loans, commercial real estate loans. You can see how they have declined just recently, just in the last few months, they're dropping a lot. Why? multiple reasons. One, the vacancy rate has gone up a lot. Banks want a higher amount of equity in, in the um, uh, equation. And the work from home factor uh, is people are just not renting as much space as they were, which is causing real estate values to drop, which is causing uh, difficulty in refinancing and financing of real, uh, commercial real estate mortgages. There is a survey that's done for consumers uh, of, do you feel like buying a home? Is this a good environment for buying a home? This goes back to 1960. So this is about 65 years old, 65 years of data there have been several periods of decline, deep decline in the stock market and in the economy. 73, 74, 80, 81, 2000 to 2003, and 2008. And the two that were the harshest was the early 70s and the late 70s or early 80s. And you can see those in the, toward the left side of the chart. There's a circle around how far down that survey went. This is when the stock market dropped, in both cases, about 50%. Very hard times. And it is at the same place today. Why? Because um, prices are high and, relatively speaking, uh, mortgage rates are high, they're, they're maybe, let's say, 7%, and you say, historically, that's not necessarily that high, but uh, related to people's ability to afford buying a home relative to what they're making, it is all the way back to the 1973, 74, or the late 70s, early 80s. Very interesting. This is people's perception about buying conditions for a home. So I saw this quote. This is uh, attributed here to Jeremy Siegel, Professor Jeremy Siegel from the Wharton School, but it's also attributed to um, John Bogle. So I don't know which <laughs> came up with it first, so I won't say, but I got this from the internet. And the, the, this is related to investing. And it says this, and I think there is a message in here and I'll explain it. Stay the course no matter what happens, no matter what happens, stick to your program or to your methodology. I've said stay the course a thousand times and I meant it every time. It is the most important single piece of investment wisdom I can give to you. To me, that sounds more like John Bogle than Jeremy Siegel but it doesn't matter. The, what this means is that 
you have a methodology of investing in types of stocks or types of bonds or some combination of stocks and bonds. There is a lot of wisdom in this statement. However, there is a macro view that I think today people have not factored in. Most people, the experts, have been trained in the last 40 years and the regime, the type of the impact of bonds over the last 40 years has now changed and just in the last few years. So it is catching people off guard and they're not knowing how to deal with it because their returns are negative or anemic. If you are a buy and hold investor, which I think this relates to, a vast, vast majority are, it says that your stocks and your bonds are going to tend to counterbalance each other and one will make up for the other. The problem is that has been developed over a long period of time. And if you take the period of time from during the last 40 years, the early 80s, until the last couple of years, say 2021, what you would see is that the uh, bonds have now started to go down with equities. They are not providing a counterbalance. So uh, while this is probably good advice, uh, it is leaving a lot of people scratching their heads. If you're all equities, some people are, all equities is a very, very rough ride because when you look at Warren Buffett or you look at uh, the S&P 500, uh, you would say during the last 50 years, there have been four times, four times where the market, the equity market has approximately gone down 50%, 50% and sometimes more. And if, you, if you're all equities, can you withstand a 50% decline happened four times in the last 50 years, approximately. Uh, most people cannot. So that's why they put bonds oftentimes, or other assets, but bonds are common, put those together with equities to soften that ride. The problem is that you go back a couple of years to 2022, and the decline of bonds, particularly government bonds, uh, was greater in many cases than stocks. Your stock portfolio, generally speaking, was down less. They were all down a lot, but bonds were down even worse. So here we are in this regime. So I want to show you a chart. If you're a buy and hold investor and you use an advisor, I will bet you the advisor has not shown you this chart. Now, I've shown it a couple of times in the past, but I'm going to show it again because I want to make the point of why this statement has a lot of validity, but today it has less validity than it has had in the past. This chart shows that the dark line, the dark blue line is the price. This goes from 19... Uh, let's see, it goes back a long ways to in the 1920s, 1926. So the dark line relates to the price of bonds. Now I'm assuming they're using government bonds here. Everything is disclosed. But the price of bonds, uh, this is a macro, macro chart, okay? So you can see there have been three cycles in about the last hundred years, up and down and up, the dark line. There have also been three cycles in the light blue line, which is the bond yield. And you can see that the bond yield tends to go it's inversely correlated. It tends to move in an opposite direction from the price of bonds. If bonds go up, yields go down and vice versa. So you can see <laughs> that during these three macro periods of yield that 
yields have come down, bond prices have gone up. At the very, the last part of the cycle, the last one cycle, 40 years, you can see from the late 70s, early 80s, that in the black arrow on the right, that the price of bonds went up. The price, the yield went down. And here we are today. So where do you think, looking at this macro cycle, think of the next 40 years, or 10 or 20 or 30, whatever you want to call it, I'm going to call it at least 30. Where do you think bond prices are going to go and where do you think bond yields are going to go? Based on this macro cycle, and I'm not talking for the next week or the next month, I'm talking macro cycle, it tells me that the move up in, in bond prices, the, the next move that prices, the black arrow, is coming down. And bond yields, which is correlated to interest rates, are going up. And we have already started to see it since 2021. So if that's the case, and you've got a buy and hold portfolio that includes bonds, and many do, I don't fault you for that, uh, what you have to be prepared for, and you've already seen it in the last three years, you have seen that, two and a half to three years, you have seen that bond prices, the bond portion of your portfolio is negative, probably. Corporate, government, long-term, intermediate term, whatever you have, the bond portion is killing you. And granted, the, the stocks have gone up and down, but more, more up than down. But since I don't think you can stand an equity-only portfolio, what are you going to do? I can tell you that financial advisors do not have a clue. They won't tell you this, but I'll tell you this. They don't have a clue on what to do to counter equity risk. They've been married to this for since 1952, called Modern Portfolio Theory, Asset Allocation, 60-40, whatever you want to call it. They've been married to this methodology. But as you can see, the methodology is hurting today. As stock prices come down, equity price, bond prices are also coming down. I want to play, I have three clips to play for you. First is a professor from NYU uh, School of Business, finance professor, um, and his name is Asworth Damoderan. So I may refer to him as the professor. <laughs> um, and um, so he's, he takes an interesting view. The view is that the seven, magnificent seven, the seven tech stocks that have pulled the market up almost by themselves have increased, the va increased in value 8.8 .8 trillion. That's not their value, that's their increase in value in the last couple of years. Um, and they are delivering significant earnings and cash flow. What is the definition of a value stock? Earnings and cash flow. So have you ever thought about the idea that the Magnificent Seven, the high, high growth stocks, are actually value stocks? He kind of makes a case for it. But he also says that values are getting high. And he goes through some historical uh, calculations to show you that. And he ends it by saying, we may need a correction to clean it up. If we have a correction, my view is that everything comes down. Now, once in a while, precious metals will go up or energy will go up, but it's hard to predict that in advance because those um, are, they may work in this market, but they won't, don't work in another market. So uh, I will generally speaking say everything comes down when it comes down. And that will probably mean the Magnificent Seven will come down. But for sure, the market itself is overvalued. We all know that. And it needs some kind of a correction. He was kind in the way he said it. But I'll play this piece for you. Take a listen. He's the president of finance at NYU's Stern School of Business. Welcome back. It's nice to see you. 
Thank you for having me. I feel like, you know, it's becoming a bit of a broken record. I mean, we have you on, tech stocks go up, NASDAQ extends its record high, and I ask you the same questions because they're the only questions that really seem to matter right, right now. But your answers might have changed because the stocks continue to go up and the valuations theoretically are getting more extended. How do you answer it now? It's a bit like Groundhog Day, you're absolutely right. We talk about the same issues over and over. But collectively, these seven stocks have had, I mean, it's not just the last six months. If you look at last year and a half, they've added $8.8 .8 trillion in market cap, just these seven companies. Just to give you perspective, the second largest market in the world, China, is a market cap of $12.1 These seven stocks alone have added more in market cap than the entire German market, the French market, the Swiss market. It's been an astonishing run. But I would also argue that before we dismiss these as risky tech companies, these are the money machines in this market. So when Jeremy Siegel talked about value stocks, I think in many ways, these have become the value stocks for investors who care about earnings and cash flows, because these are the companies that are delivering those earnings and cash flows. Wow, so, so, you, so you don't necessarily think that we're in any kind of danger zone in terms of valuation here? Now, if we're in danger zone, it's not just the seven stocks are in the danger zone of tech stocks, it's a market overall. I mean, I compute a monthly market equity risk premium. It's my personal indicator of how hot or cold the market is. Start of July, that equity risk premium, the implied equity risk premium for the market is 4.11%. That's the lowest number it's been since September of 2008. In other words, it's almost as if the market has raised the last 15 years, and we're looking at numbers very much like they what they used to be before the big crisis, the 2008 crisis. And the question we can ask is, is the market overreaching on that assumption? But a 4% T-bond rate and a 4.11% equity risk premium is 2005-2006 numbers, not 2018 or 2019 numbers. I mean, does that, does that tell you that we might be heading into a, a certain place we need to be aware of? Yeah, I think we need to be careful. I think 4% to me is a red, red flag, at least from the numbers I've looked at historically. Once equity risk premiums drop below 4%, it's almost like a magnet pulling them back towards a 4%. So I'm going to track that number, and I track it at the start of every month. And at the moment, I think we're getting to a point where even pre-2008 status, you'd say this market is reaching you know, a, a, a zone where you, you might need a correction to clean it up again. So next, I want to play this. This is from Peter Berzin and he is the uh, chief global investment strategist for BCA Research. Now, they're not a big name like one of the large brokerage firms, so you may not know of BCA Research, but they are, the industry relies on them for investment research. They have offices in New York, London, Hong Kong, Singapore, Shanghai, and Sydney, and he is based out of Toronto. Um, he is being interviewed by David Lin, who I like, and who is also based out of Toronto. Um, I respect the fact that he has historically called it correctly. I like people like this because they're not just married to a view of put your money in the market and leave it alone. They understand that the market goes through these large cycles and there, there's a time to be invested and there's a time not to be invested. And he takes that view. He has been bullish on the market and saying be invested when many actually have said you know it's too risky he said no you need to be invested he went to neutral and now he's bearish saying it's getting too risky um, and he makes the case for bear market conditions so because he's been right and because he's willing to shift his positions um, i value what he has to say so take a listen um, to peter Berzin. Peter Bears joins us today. He is the chief global strategist at BCA Research, and he's going to explain to us why he's now bearish, expecting an up to 30% decline in the S&P 500 as a recession eventually rolls in. Peter, welcome back to the show. Good to be back on. Peter, like I said in the introduction, you've correctly called for the stock markets to go higher, but you've changed from being moderately constructive to neutral to now bearish. Walk us through 
the logic of changing your outlook. In wrestling parlance, I've gone from being a face to a heel. You know, I'm bearish on stocks. Uh, I mean, the analogy that I've been using is that of a glass of water. So imagine taking a warm glass of water and putting it into the freezer. And if you're kind of periodically opening the freezer every few minutes, it'll still look like a wa- still it'll still look water for a while. Uh, but eventually it'll freeze over and turn to ice. It'll under- undergo this phase transition. So suppose that we're not talking about the temperature of the freezer anymore. We're talking about the stance of monetary policy. <clears throat> monetary policy has been tight now for a couple of years, but the economy was so hot two years ago that it's taken a while for it to cool down to the point that it could freeze over. Two years ago, we had all those excess pandemic savings. We had the huge numbers of job openings. People would lose a job, no problem, walk across the street and find new work. Uh, we, we, had, we had the fact that people re- renegotiated um, their mortgage uh, during the pandemic at very favorable rates. Unfortunately, all of that insulation has sort of worn thin at this point. The excess savings are gone. The job openings are down to more normal levels. And increasingly, a larger share of people are faced with these higher rate mortgages, not just households, by the way, but businesses also that uh, renew their loans at very low rates and now are, are seeing their rates uh, go up. So unfortunately, that glass of water is very close to freezing over. And when it freezes over, We'll have a recession. Let's talk about this uh, recession in just a minute. But going back to the stock markets, the stock markets may not be always reflective of the real economy, right? Just because perhaps the economy is slowing down and growth doesn't necessarily mean this euphoria or bullish sentiment uh, would dissipate. Um, is that is that true? Within moderation. So, I mean, if you look at the equal weight index, you look at small caps, they're performing much more in line with what you would expect from a slowing economy. Uh, the S&P 500, which of course is now heavily dominated by a handful of tech stocks is outperforming the other indices. Uh, but that bullish sentiment will fall to the wayside if the economy enters a recession, it always does. People are not gonna remain euphoric on stocks if unemployment is uh, surging. So I don't, I, I don't think that the AI names are going to bail out the S&P. Far from it, we could actually underperform the S&P if we enter a recession. And finally, I wanna play a piece from Warren Buffett. Now, he is considered the uh, most successful, certainly the most well-known and very successful investor in the world. And he is closely followed. This is done by a blogger who makes the case for how well uh, Warren Buffett has done. But, A few years ago, I read this piece that from CNBC that said that he has lost 50% of his money approximately four times, 73, 74, 79 to 81, 2000, 2003, and 2008. Some a little more, some a little less, but on average, about 50% of his money. And he is, in the last 15 years, has been accumulating cash. And he accumulates cash to be able to buy things at low prices. So when they become on sale, and that's his approach as a value investor, I'm just gonna accumulate cash. When they go on sale, they become cheap enough, I'll buy them. He's done that for a long time and has been very successful at it. He is not at all concerned about the fact, even though he's criticized, he's not at all concerned about the fact that he has 189 billion sitting in cash, money market or short-term instruments, waiting for the opportunity to buy. His shareholders and others have criticized him for that, but he is strong in the idea that um, his track record is right. It shows in this clip of how um, when he was criticized, he actually was vindicated. Um, So I think there is a case to be made for his wisdom, his years and decades of experience and saying today things are overvalued. I don't know when they're gonna come down. I think in the next month, even the rest of this year, 
I personally don't think they probably are. I can't guarantee that. It just doesn't feel like it. It feels like we have momentum right now and it's time to be invested, which we are. Uh, but when that shifts, and it will, um, then there is a time to get out. And um, that, my opinion is, I think that'll probably happen in the next one to three years. But I'm not putting that as a specific time frame that has to happen. I just think it's, it's in our future. I don't think we're going to wait a long time for it. But I also don't think it's right in front of us. So it's kind of a macro, intermediate term to macro view. And so I am uh, bearish on the market on that time frame. For the immediate time frame, I'm bullish on the market. So we are invested, and I think it's a positive time to be invested. And we've been invested for a year and a half now. And uh, I'm glad that we are. I've been very, very few times, very small amount of times that we've been out of the market. And uh, that's working well for us. We use uh, AI, a machine learning component of AI, to determine when to do that. We've made that shift a couple of months ago. Uh, and that's working exceptionally well. Uh, it's complex enough that I can't explain it to you, but I know that it works. Um, so uh, take a listen to this. Keep in mind, this is you'll recognize it. It is a blogger, who, and she's showing some interviews that he did with Becky Quick uh, and at the annual shareholder uh, Berkshire Hathaway conference. But she also makes some um, illustrations about him and his investing style. So take a listen. But I don't mind at all under current conditions building the uh, cash position. I think when I look at the alternative of what's available in the equity markets and I look at the composition of what's going on in the world, we find it quite attractive. Warren Buffett is prepping for a staggering $55 trillion storm that has been brewing in the stock market for the last 15 years. Buffett's favorite stock market indicator is flashing alarm bells, warning that a 40% decline in the stock market could happen any day now. For background, Buffett is by far the most closely followed investor in the entire world. Every move he makes is scrutinized to the very smallest detail. Warren Buffett is universally regarded as the greatest investor of all time. However, he has been eerily quiet as of late when it comes to buying stocks. In fact, Buffett has even been selling billions of dollars worth of Apple stock, a company just a couple of years ago was considered one of his quote, forever holdings. As a result, Buffett's cash pile at Berkshire Hathaway has hit a staggering $189 billion, leaving many people to believe he is piling up cash to prepare for an upcoming stock market crash. We will own Apple and American Express and Coca-Cola when Greg takes over this place, but I don't mind at all under current conditions building the uh, cash position. I think when I look at the alternative of what's available in the equity markets, and I look at the composition of what's going on in the world, we find it quite attractive. He said that he did this because he didn't mind building up the, yeah. the cash hoard at this point because of the environment that's taking place, I guess the economic environment, the stock outlook. I mean, I tried to pull a little more out of him later with another question, and he didn't bite on it. But what are you going to do with all that cash? Why do you need all that cash? He says he can't find good places to put it, and that makes you wonder if he thinks the entire market's overvalued. Buffett has repeatedly said in public venues that it is impossible to time the market. However, this may be an example of the old saying, do as I say, not as I do. As we can see here, despite Buffett professing that he never tries to time the stock market, he surely does always seem to have a large amount of cash ready to buy stocks when the market crashes. In gray here, we have the Berkshire Hathaway cash pile by quarter from the years 1996 to 2018. The orange line represents the price of the S&P 500 during that time period. For reference, the S&P is an index consisting of 500 of the largest publicly traded companies listed in the United States. It is generally considered a proxy for the U.S. stock market. There is a couple of very important time periods to draw your attention to. The first is the dot-com bubble in 1998 and 1999. As you can see here, the S&P 500 was up over 50% from the beginning of 1998 to its eventual peak just a couple of years later. During that time, Warren Buffett was avoiding investing in the stock market. As you can see, Berkshire's cash position climbed by a factor of 10 over just a couple of years. 
During this time, there was a significant number of people claiming that Buffett was washed up. Critics said his style of investing didn't work anymore and that Buffett was foolish for not investing in the high-flying technology sector. This period culminated with Buffett's now infamous lecture at the exclusive Sun Valley Conference. For background, Sun Valley is an invite-only annual conference for the most influential people in the media, technology, and finance industry. In the year 1999, the conference was filled with newly minted millionaires and billionaires as a result of the soaring stock market driven by young technology companies. In an ironic twist, the keynote speaker that year at the conference was none other than Warren Buffett himself. Buffett had famously avoided investing in technology companies, instead making his wealth by investing in boring, so-called old economy businesses. As only Buffett can do, he proceeded to use his keynote speech to kindly explain to that year's attendees how the stock market was in a serious bubble. In his wholesome and folksy way, Buffett told the crowd that while things may look great now, it was only a matter of time before the hypothetical music stopped playing. As I'm sure you can imagine, this did not make Buffett popular amongst the crowd. In fact, he was practically booed off stage. I'm sure you know how this story ends, however. Not too long after Buffett's speech, the dot-com bubble burst. The S&P fell by over 50% and the tech-heavy Nasdaq fell by a staggering 75%. In fact, it wasn't until the year 2015, 15 years later, when the Nasdaq returned to levels hit during the peak of the bubble. Many of the people that said Buffett was washed up saw their fortunes disappear in the crash. Going back to the chart of Buffett's cash position, Buffett used the dot-com bubble crash as a buying opportunity, spending down his cash position buying attractive investments for cheap prices. There is a saying that history doesn't repeat, but it sure does rhyme. You can see here that Buffett also built up a significant cash position during the run-up of the Great Financial Crisis. Buffett's cash pile grew to an all-time record at that time of over $40 billion, more than double the amount of cash Buffett had sitting on the sidelines during the dot-com bubble. As the stock market again sold off by over 50%, Buffett subsequently spent down his cash position, buying up wonderful assets for low prices. This included buying the railroad, BNSF, for $34 billion. That business is likely worth at least $150 billion now, resulting in a $100 billion profit for Buffett and Berkshire. Buffett also invested tens of billions into prominent blue-chip companies. These included the industrial conglomerate General Electric, chemical producer Dow Chemical, the food company Mars, owner of popular brands such as the Three Musketeers, M&Ms, and Snickers. He also invested heavily into financial services companies Goldman Sachs and Bank of America. The Bank of America position is one Buffett continues to hold as of the making of this video. So there are some lessons to be learned uh, from Warren Buffett, actually from all three of these gentlemen. So um, thank you for watching. If you have questions or comments, leave them in the comment section below.